I didn't think in provincial terms. I was thinking like an open-ended shopper. Hi, I'm Bruce Campbell, and I live in Oregon in this jetliner, a Boeing 727-200, which was a Greek airliner named Mount Parnusius. I'm an electrical engineer by training and trade and now investing. I've been here for about 43 years on this property. I've lived in the aircraft for about 17 years. Most elements of life are the same as everyone else's lives, although the environment has a certain charm. It makes all the little things that we consider pretty tedious, less tedious. Come on inside. Thank you for taking your shoes off, helping me keep things clean. These are the lavatories. Here's the right aft lav, which is for guests primarily. And here's the left aft lav, which is for me primarily. My primitive shower, which is adequate for now. And actually I feel completely comfortable with it. It's not important to finish it, not nearly as important as other tasks. And this is my refrigerator, old but good. As a nerd, what I really wanted was the aerospace ambiance. You know, I, I wanted the aircraft as it was. I did have all the seat rows but I sold about half of them to a theme restaurant developer and gave away almost all the rest. I don't need rooms. I don't need a bedroom because nobody else is here. So I let evolution take its course. Now, my makeshift kitchen, microwave oven and toaster oven, I don't cook, so <laughs> this is enough for me. My futon sofa, emergency wing exits are here and here and there and here. This is not Boeing material. This is to keep velociraptors out. Watch the mass, it's 15 kilograms. It'll swing into your shin if you're not careful. Okay, this is the fun part. This is the right wing. It's like an all-purpose fun deck. It's strong, it's durable, and, um, and it's usually clean, but it's not now. Sometimes it's simply a work surface, and sometimes lunch with friends, um, any other activity which comes up, it's, it's an all-purpose deck. We have concerts on a wing here sometimes. This is Yuko Sama's wing. She is the first person to perform a concert on the wing of a jetliner in the cosmos, as far as I know. She sets up here, renders her incredible music to guests which listen and enjoy in the area in front of the wing. Let's go tour the flight deck. The flight deck is a work in progress. It was fully skeletonized by the salvage company. When they were finished with their work, there was almost nothing left. I did have the circuit breaker panels. However, all of the instruments were gone. So all I had were empty racks with empty holes everywhere. This aircraft provides 1,066 square feet of floor space and cargo holds for storage space are in addition to that. The wingspan is about 100 feet. There are 80 cabin windows, two galleys, three lavatories, two of which I've made functional, and of course, all the original infrastructure, although damaged by the salvage company in considerable degree. The aircraft face east because at the solstice, when the sun rises during the longest day of summer, the sun pierces the number two engine nacelle and flows into the cathedral-like area of the air stairs. And during those few days at sunrise, that entire area is ablaze with light and it's really pretty magical. When you live in a jetliner, you feel as though you're stepping forward into the future with the rest of the highest levels of human endeavors. Um, it's a nice feeling and it's also a great big toy. When, when I was a kid, my mother 
who is a very resourceful and determined woman, worked her hands almost to the bones restoring an old home, and she did a beautiful job. However, that home will only last another 30 years, I suspect. And there, there's a certain sadness to the investment of her heart and soul and ultimately her life. When you have a home like this, you feel as though everything you do really counts because it can last a really long time. So as you take all those little steps to improve your life, you know, this is a permanent improvement. This is not going to last just my life or maybe one more. And there are a bunch of things which can happen to a traditional structure which just can't really be much of a problem for a jetliner. There's no typhoon or tornado or hurricane which even gets close. I never considered a traditional home. Maybe I should have. I, I know that it's common provincial behavior, and, it, and there's rationality to it, of course. The process is very refined. However, it still sticks in metal spikes for the most part. And imagine you were an extraterrestrial cruising by, and during the course of the long voyage since you were bored, you peered down at other celestial bodies and spotted, hey, Earth, wow, what are they up to? There's a group over here gathering sticks, and then they take them someplace and they're pounding them together with metal spikes. There's another group over there shredding their finest aerospace technology. Don't they see each other? That was my thinking in some respects. I could see no real rationality to allowing aerospace technology to not be utilized when it was available and revert to something while very well proven is still a pretty ancient technology and typically only lasts about two generations and sometimes not that long. This aircraft retired in Greece. It was ferried from Athens International Airport to the United States, re-registered in Kansas, and then flown to Hillsborough Airport, and then was towed that evening to the Hillsborough Ferry Complex. The dismantling work by the salvage company occurred there, and then it was towed starting at midnight to my neighbor's property, and there was no way for the aircraft to move from my neighbor's property to my property. So we had to cut down about a row and a half or roughly two rows of my trees, my sons and daughters, in order to do that. That was a little painful, but it was necessary. The move through downtown Hillsboro was very snug. There were two intersections which were of considerable concern, and I had a precision drawing of the aircraft courtesy of Boeing, so I simply plotted the aircraft on the street drawing and indicated where the aircraft should be positioned at each moment during the turn, and moved it through a segment at a time in order to prove that it could be done. And then I ran a dynamic simulation in which it moved one segment at a time in a slideshow. And every time it happened in virtual space, I went because the tail of the aircraft would swing wildly toward a big pole which could not be removed. I was convinced every time that that tail would impact the light pole, it swung quickly toward the pole and then sort of abruptly stopped and moved forward as the aircraft moved forward. And the same thing happened in real life as, as the aircraft drew through the intersection very precisely according to marks on the road which we made so that we could follow the drawing precisely. The tail started swinging and everyone, we, we were all in this, Oh, okay, it's all right, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it was dramatic. I spent $100,000 to purchase the aircraft and an additional $120,000 for logistics, transport expenses, rent of space for dismantling work, and so on. About $60,000 of that was really unnecessary. If I did it again, I could eliminate about half of those costs. My living environment is not really what I intended. I, I made a terrible mistake on the front end in partnering with a salvage company. It's a little as if you're a home shopper and you call a home wrecking company and say, would you please wreck a home? Just completely destroy it. I'll give you my good hard earned money for the rubble which is left. They would of course, and the salvage company did say, <laughs> okay, sure, we'll take your good hard earned money for that, no problem. Frankly, I've come to a point with this aircraft 
where I'm no longer dedicating any energy and effort toward uh, restoration of the flight deck. The version 2.0 project is far more important to me. When I started this project, I intended it to be my nest egg, and in some regards, I still proceed as if that's the case, but I've engaged in a version 2.0 project, which is a 747-400 home for Miyazaki. For the version 2.0 project, we intend the outside to be just gleaming, slick, beautiful, and the inside too. But at the core of that is the fact that the aircraft is so strong and it's a sealed pressure canister. You are so safe and clean inside and it will withstand almost anything the earth can dish out. And although not quite everything, but almost anything it will last practically forever. Dust can't get in, let alone insects or rodents. It will hardly notice the worst windstorm you could possibly encounter. It will hardly notice an earthquake. This is the most immediate project. The aircraft is being supported by this cribbing pile, by this stack of railroad ties and other timbers. The landing gear is just hanging in the air, as you can see, and we're essentially ready to pour concrete. It'll be a big pillar because I want the aircraft to be able to wander around extensively during the earthquake because when we get an earthquake here, it'll be a big earthquake. So this is a big and very important project on my agenda. I'm on sloping property, so I need a pillar for the forward landing gear to rest upon, and I need a pillar for the left gear as well. Until those are complete, I need to keep mass aft in the aircraft. Once that concrete is cured and the nose is lowered down, then we will fabricate the left gear support pillar. Once that is cured, then I can move mass everywhere. People often ask me where the favorite location in the aircraft is for me. Anywhere the work is ends up being my favorite spot of the aircraft because I become entangled existentially with that element of the aircraft. We become buddies <laughs> and we work together until the project for that location is complete. My hope is that this project will enhance people's vision of aerospace class castles as homes and that it will gain a lot of traction so that it continues to occur. The important thing is save the aircraft. They're retired at the rate of about three per day. And this is a big resource which has a lot to offer. If we can develop it to a point where it almost always has a second life, then we have eliminated a big waste. There, there won't be any more shredding operations anywhere. Sometimes people ask if I get lonely. I never get lonely. I have visitors very nearly every day. Even when I'm alone, I never feel lonely. I'm engaged. In my personal experience, this has been a considerable success. Not only because of the existential joy of working with aerospace technology and experiencing it, but also the very rich joy of the social environment that it has created. The option was to say, okay, it's my private home. Um, it's, it's done and I'm going about my private life. Um, look at it from the road if you like, it's fine, but please don't bother me, I've got things to do. That was an option. For me, opening the home and the vision to the community has enriched my life immensely. A lot of very dear friends and loved ones have become connected to me because of this project, because of a common interest or a common fascination, and ultimately as a common vision for the future. Since I was a kid, I always thought, there's no harm in trying anything you can come back from. If it's so dangerous that you might lose a limb or you lose your life, that doesn't qualify. You can't get back to where you started. But anything else, if it doesn't work, you've probably learned something anyway. Provincial has become a rather favorite word to me. It's an endearing word because in the course of my life, it seems as though the more I avoid provincial things, the happier I am. Sometimes people ask me what the word provincial means to me. And it's simple. It means doing things the same way they've been done in the past. And without defining the extent of the past, the longer they've been done, the more provincial they are. It's a non-exploratory behavior. And it's okay in some areas, it's even wise in some areas. 
but doing it all the time isn't wise in my opinion. Provincial is a double-edged sword. We engage in things which are well proven and we don't have to repeat mistakes, but it also blinds us to opportunities. And somewhere between those two hazards um, is a good middle ground. My sense is that it's better to err toward the exploratory error than the safety error, because the rewards of finding something new is some kind of treasure, something of significance. Why stay provincial if you have those branches that you can go explore? We don't see them most of the time, and they remain invisible unless we are bold about changing things. I was so caught up in the fascination with the concept and the sense that I can absolutely do this, that I didn't really consider whether I should do it, whether it was wise to do it, and, and I didn't even consider whether I might fail. Uh, but I knew in my heart that it would be fun. And even if it had failed outright, I felt as though I would have been happy that I did it.